Hello, and welcome to Device Week, a podcast where journalists from the Gray Sheet talk about issues they're reporting on for the device and diagnostics community. I'm Gray Sheet Editor David Fillmore, and today I'm joined by Danny Farouk and our Senior Editor, Reed Miller. Today, Danny will talk about his conversation with FDA Deputy Commissioner Robert Califf, and we'll also hit on some diagnostic topics, the device tax at Capitol Hill, and a big a new FDA approval for the tavern market. First, Danny, you got a chance to sit down with Robert Califf, a big-time cardiologist and a clinical researcher who became a deputy commissioner at FDA a few months ago. What did you get to talk about? Yeah, uh, Dave, it was actually pretty interesting. Uh, I was at the Drug Innovation Association annual meeting this week, and I got to hear Dr. Califf uh, talk, and Jeffrey Shuren was there also. Uh, one of the things that came up uh, pretty substantially was uh, their concerns with some of the uh, issues surrounding combination products. So uh, Dr. Califf talked about some of the problems they've had with combination products in the past. Uh, in our conversation, he also gave me some tips on what companies can do to improve their chances of getting such products approved and, and what the agency is doing to reform its oversight process. I also uh, heard uh, Dr. Shuren speak, and, and that's something I'm working on for next week, uh, where he uh, talked about maybe a need for another pathway uh, for a combination products. So a lot of interesting stuff going on at that meeting uh, in regards to combination products as well as other issues. Yeah, I've heard Dr. Califf is actually really interested in that combo product issue in general from a few sources, so that's, uh, it's good you got a chance to hear from him directly. Um, another thing I hear about Califf, of course, is, you know, he's definitely rumored as a candidate for the commissioner. Definitely it came up when he was uh, appointed to the FDA a few months ago. Did you get a chance to talk to him about that at all? Any sense of if that's a possibility for the future, take over FDA is the top spot? You know, that was that was a fun question, uh, and uh, you know he he kind of tiptoed around the issue a little. Uh, he said he's not opposed to the idea, but also emphasized that he feels like there's still a lot of work he wants to get done in this current job, uh, and is enjoying working under Acting Commissioner Stephen Ostroff. Uh, but he also emphasized that he and uh, Dr. Ostroff are pretty complementary in their roles, and he'd like to keep it that way. Good answer, I guess. Except switching topics, I think you covered the uh, device stack. There was some, you know more updates, more efforts to repeal that. What's the update this week? So, uh, yeah, the device tax is uh, an interesting issue. This is about, I think, the second time uh, that this device tax has been uh, passed through the House. Uh, Last time was back in 2012. So it got some overwhelming uh, votes. But, you know, now is the real struggle because it'll have to pass through the Senate and also has to have enough votes in the Senate in order to uh, uh, be able to ward off a presidential veto, which President Obama has kind of promised uh, because uh, he, he sees it as a threat uh, to his uh, signature health care law, the Affordable Care Act. Right. So it seems like the I mean, the device tax repeal has gotten a lot of momentum, but it sounds like the issue is about, you know, how do we pay for this and whether Democrats and Obama can get behind um, you know, something that would take money away from what has been supporting the um, no, absolutely. The Obamacare. Yeah, that's that's one of the issues with the current uh, uh, bill. I, I think that some of the opponents of the bill have raised is that there's no offset to pay for uh, the money that it was supposed to raise, uh, which in, in in turn was supposed to help pay for the Affordable Care Act. And on the Senate side, you know, we've reported already on this. Uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar is uh, trying to figure out a way to uh, provide some offsets because she doesn't think that legislatures uh, on the upper house. Uh, are willing to go along with this unless there's an offset. Right. Well, definitely something to watch. Um, I think the the last thing we're going to touch on with you, Danny, is some more rumblings, I think, about Medicare coverage issues or payment issues with the um, diagnostic reimburse diagnostic reimbursement, um, particularly molecular diagnostics. Uh, what did you look at there? Uh, that was a, a really interesting story, and, and we, we covered that. Uh, the, the issue there is that um, the industry is still very confused about how to pay for or how to get reimbursed for uh, diagnostic tests, um, these molecular diagnostic tests. And uh, in the past, there have been some concerns over how these tests, uh, the, the, uh, the pricing of these tests are uh, determined, and uh, the, the gist that I get from this is that uh, in, in the new uh, list of codes that CMS provides and the determinations that they provide, the overwhelming majority of those tests still don't have a, a pricing for them, and uh, it seems like industry is kind of just waiting for 2017 to roll around when uh, a new payment system is supposed to come into effect. That'll look uh, closer uh, closer at the private sector 
for uh, price determination. So uh, that seems to be the issue. But uh, industry is also concerned that CMS was supposed to come out with a new rule this month, uh, to uh, a final rule actually, to uh, uh, s- uh, set up how the, the, the future price determinations are going to be uh, estimated. And a draft rule has not been uh, provided yet. And that's kind of uh, making industry a little nervous. So potential, this could, this could roll on longer than expected, essentially. Yeah, th- th- there's, there's a, a quite a strong likelihood likelihood that it might because uh, right now uh, what they're saying is it's going to take them at least about six months to update their systems in order to uh, accommodate the rule when it comes out. Um, and so far, not not even a draft rule has been out. Thanks. Well, that the diagnostics focus is a good seg- segue to some uh, Capitol Hill reporting we did this week. Our reporter, Sue Darcy, who's away, spoke to some sources about a bill that's circulating in the Senate Help Committee that would revamp basically how tests are regulated in a pretty big way. So the bill would basically create a new center within FDA specifically focus on, on in vitro tests and more, but more so would create a new regulatory category um, called in vitro clinical tests, essentially putting these lab developed test services um, and test kits uh, sold as packages into one category that would be distinct from all other medical devices and sort of regulated in their own way. It's intended, this is an idea that's been proposed by some industry players, it's kind of intended as a compromise uh, to address debate over whether FDA should be regulating uh, lab-developed tests in the, fir- in the first place. So Dave, is, is there any chance of that being passed? Well, it's just in the sort of pre-circulation stage. I mean, no actual bill has been released publicly. publicly. But this, of course, comes as there's a lot of big reforms moving through through the uh, through the Congress in terms of FDA NIH stuff, um, particularly on the House side with 21st century cures legislation. But the Senate is presumably planning some sort of parallel legislation, so pieces like this could get hooked into those broader legislation. But at the same time, the 21st century cures bill in the House doesn't have any big diagnostics regulatory reforms like this in it right now. So it would suggest maybe it's not, uh, you know, maybe it's not ready for that yet. Maybe there's just too too, con- too controversial at this point. Um, but there, you know, so we'll we'll see. There's been actually more action in in the uh, in Congress this week with uh, medical device related legislation, uh, particularly in the Senate, with uh, Senators Burr and Franken Franken um, introducing another bill with some targeted provisions that basically come right out of the House that broad house cures package, but just a few targeted device provisions they're calling the Device Accountability Act, and it would address the least burdensome provision, uh, centralized IRBs, and CLIO waiver standards. So there's a lot of activity going on in the Senate on a lot of different issues. How that all gets looped in, whether these ultimately all come together into one big cures-like package in the Senate or whether they kind of fade away for now, we'll have to see. The next chance, of course, will be uh, user fee reauthorization, which will be going through um, by 2017. Um, so uh, a lot to see, a lot of possible chances for big changes. Reed, uh, why don't we switch gears yeah. and go into sort of the product space. There was, a, I think, a pretty big approval this week in the transcatheter aortic valve um, sector. Could you... Anything yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so Edward, Edwards Life Sciences, uh, third generation transcatheter aortic valve, which is called the Sapien 3 valve, uh, was approved by FDA this week. And it comes um, at least several months earlier than they expected. Uh, sort of the timeline for getting this important approval is actually kind of sped up over, over time. Uh, like two years ago, they were saying it was going to be 2016, and then earlier this year they thought maybe they could get it by the end of this year, and now here we are, and they and they have it in June. And the reason why they were able to get it so fast was that FDA uh, sort of changed its approach to the kind of trial data it was willing to accept um, for a new transcatheter valve. In the past, they've always wanted to see a full two years of follow-up um, from the you know major pivotal trial, U.S. pivotal trial of a valve. Um, but in this case, they were willing to accept uh, just a 30-day follow-up from the Partner 2 trial, and we're so impressed that they were willing to say, well, based on what we know uh, from all the other previous trials of uh, these kind of valves, um, we, we we're pretty willing to be confident that you know this impressive uh, 30-day tr- um, data will be enough, and we're, we're confident that it will not have any you know big problems going out to two years. Um, so, so that's why they were able to get it approved so fast. So that then that also um, 
could apply to you know other companies that are working on on this kind of valve. Uh, most importantly, Medtronic is sort of next in line. They already have a device um, on the U.S. market, but they want to um, get their Evolute R device, which would be sort of the third generation, or the, I guess sort of like the equivalent generation to Sapien um, 3. So it puts Edwards in a great position now, uh, maybe the, the, you know even before they're really ready to commercialize, but um, it puts them in a great position to take uh, the lead again in the U.S. market for transcatheter valves. And this could sound, so this does sound, as you're saying, have some implications for the taffer market broadly in terms of really maybe a, a quicker way for everybody to, to sort of get, get through the process. Right. Well, we'll see how it goes. I mean, obviously, it's, um, you know, this is really just specific to Edwards and, and, and you know, and the, and the data they were able to show. They, it's not like FDA has said, oh, yeah, now this is just the new standard. But um, uh, a couple of the analysts think that it's, um, that the sort of FDA now can have the kind of confidence in sort of in general how these devices work uh, to be able to approve one just based on a, a shorter um, follow up, you know, just in terms of its safety and its sort of its acute uh, effectiveness. So I mean, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, there's a number of companies working on uh, competitors in this space that companies like Boston Scientific and um, St. Jude that already have devices uh, available in Europe um, working on it in the U.S. So we'll just kind of have to see how that plays out. But it would be, um, you know, an interesting development if the, if FDA was just willing to say we're so impressed by the data that. I forget about two years, 30 days is enough. Great, Reed. Thanks. Also this week we did some mergers and acquisition coverage. We uh, There's some FDA guidance documents, particularly on the investigational device exemption process, and we're going to have some European um, device regulatory reform updates on our site shortly. So you can you know, find all that and more at thegraysheet.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Graysheet. For now, I think that's all. Thanks for listening.